Okay, D, I'm gonna make you host again. All right, we're streaming, I see. We're, yeah. Terrific. Pop in there now. Yeah, I can grab. Oh, neat. And release your video here with that. Hi, folks. Hi, Devin. Thank you for making us aware that you're going to be such a rule breaker. Sorry. Because <laughs> <laughs> of my close adherence to my reading of my email that I'm fully prepared at all times. <laughs> All right, I've got 4.30, but we're going to wait a minute or two for later arrivers. Felipe's already got his beer going. <laughs> oh, Jamie, what's that on your can there, Jamie? The Ill-Tempered Gnome. I pretty much just bought it because I like the name, which is... <laughs> is it any good? Yeah, sometimes it's not a good idea, right? It actually is pretty good. It's like a slightly hoppy brown ale. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta tell you, Lindsay and I are playing this game where she comes into the, the office every day and I haven't been in regularly in weeks and she finds something to eat or drink in the office and then she emails me and asks me, how old do you think this is? <laughs> when do you think this expired? <laughs> so I found this beer in the lab fridge. How old do you think it is? <laughs> I'm I'm going with a date that is embarrassing to say out loud. <laughs> and you're still alive, Lindsay. That's that's good. This is only 2019, but oh, okay. <laughs> but the mints that I found in Devin's desk and stole and have now eaten all of expired in 2013. <laughs> the beer can age though, like a fine wine. That's what I had to use. I I didn't have anything here, and I realized I had a, a bottle of wine in the truck, so I'm. Truck wine. <laughs> Truck <Yeah>. wine. <laughs> Truck wine and aged mints. Yeah. That's M I N T S, not M I N C E, right? <laughs> Mince meat? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we ate that last week. Oh, good. All right. So um, we're at 40 participants and we're at two minutes past. Um, so um, I think we should just get started. Um, welcome everybody to IB's inaugural Lightning Talks event. Thank you very much. Um, Teresa, I'll maybe ask you to keep an eye on letting people in. Um, yeah. We've probably both been doing it as I've been talking. Um, this is a low-key event. Um, this is a great opportunity for us to just all learn more about one another and what we have going on around different parts of the um, department. Um, I'm going to, um, I got this prepared. We had a faculty meeting right before this and I have um, Dee's beer in a little cooler that I've been saving um, for this moment. And now um, I'm going to go ahead and crack my beer. Many of you have started uh, before me, but uh, that's okay. So um, that's my introduction to this event. Um, so what we're going to do now is um, I'm going to um, introduce the first speaker and the IBGSA co-presidents um, are gonna help me with other speakers. Um, so you'll see us kind of appear intermittently between um, different lightning talk speakers. Um, I guess it's probably um, best to go into speaker view for this. Um, I'm right now looking at the, um, the tiles um, and we're gonna aim for, um, four minutes per talk. Um, and like I said, we're gonna have a, um, a half time. After the first four talks, we'll take a pause and ask folks to maybe ask questions that they might have about the different talks that they heard. Um, and we'll do that maybe by raising the blue Zoom hand to keep it orderly um, during this lightning talk event. Um, then we'll do the next four and then we'll have Q and A at the end of that. So um, with no further ado, I'm going to introduce 
Jamie Cornelius, um, who is an assistant professor here in the department. Um, and the name of, or the, I'm sorry, the title of her talk is Friends with Benefits? Question mark. How social cues help birds cope when food resources decline. Take it away, Jamie. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. Okay. So social cues aren't just for sex. Unpredictability, bah, let's start over here. Four minutes. Unpredictability in the environment can cause stress in both humans and animals alike, particularly if it disrupts access to essential resources. Um, obviously animals have to have food to meet the energy costs of life. And if food becomes unstable, then they have uh, uh -oh, decisions to make, potentially risky decisions. Uh, do you hunker down and ride out a food shortage in a familiar place? Or if you're a mobile animal, do you leave and look for something better in an unfamiliar place? So my lab is interested in how birds make these decisions and what the underlying mechanisms uh, might be that help them survive unpredictability in resources. And some of my past research with uh, captive red crossbills, which is a songbird that relies on unpredictable conifer seed crops, has revealed that food restriction activates a hormonal cascade that causes elevated corticosterone levels. And this is a hormone that's thought to help coordinate a whole body response to energy stress. So food restricted crossbills have much higher um, court levels than do well-fed birds. But of course, crossbills don't make these decisions in a, you know, alone in a cage in the lab. They're usually found uh, more like this in a flock with con specifics that they make decisions with and that might provide important social information about the environment. In fact, if you give these same captive birds a neighbor uh, that is either well-fed or is also food restricted, it changes how they respond to the food stress. In other words, birds of a feather stress together. But if your neighbor is well-fed, then there's an attenuating effect on hormone secretion. And further studies revealed this effect is probably due to changes in hormone receptor expression in the brain where social cues from food restricted birds may actually sensitize the brain to stress, make it more responsive. Um, but one thing that I hadn't yet done is uh, to test the hypothesis that social information can actually prepare birds for an impending food stressor. So in this recent experiment the, over the summer, um, I had a control group that had access to food for the entire experiment, a treatment that was similar to the first experiments where neighbors are food restricted for three days in parallel with focal birds and a predictive group where the neighbors were food restricted for three days, but prior to the focal birds. So data were collected in focal birds at the end of the food restriction, which was administered by giving birds access to food for two 30 minute feeding sessions per day. Um, and I predicted that birds with predictive information might increase food intake when their neighbors were restricted, but that was actually not the case. However, birds with predicted social information did better preserve, preserve their mass during restriction. So uh, in this figure, you can see that birds with social predictive information lost less mass after three days of food restriction. But this didn't seem to be explained um, solely by differences in behavior in food intake. Uh, so I decided to do some dissections and it seems that the predictive social information may have either induced intestinal growth or protected intestinal mass during restrictions. Their intestines were significantly larger than the controls, even after three days of food restriction um, and mass loss. Um, there are reasons to suspect the control group here was a little bit weird because they were visually isolated from other birds and they were lower in mass, just generally speaking. So I also decided to put some of the restricted birds back on ad lib food for a few weeks and look at their intestinal mass after they'd recovered. And those birds also had larger intestines that were indistinguishable from the food restricted birds with predictive information. So in short, social information about declining food may have produced protective mechanisms uh, to ensure that digestive capacity remained optimal as food declined. So in combination with slight increases in food intake, this might have contributed to better mass retention during that three-day food challenge. So future goals will be to determine if the hormonal changes that we saw in the earlier experiments actually underlie these gut dynamics and to relate those mechanisms to behaviors and choices made by free-living birds. 
Four and a half minutes. I was close. <laughs> All right, John, you should be up next. Yeah, thanks so much, Jamie. That was great. So our uh, next speaker is Sarah Gravem, who is a postdoc in the department, and she will be presenting on the misalignment of the stars, dramatic yeah. global declines of the sunflower sea star Pycnopodia helianthoides. Thanks, everybody. I'm about to share my screen. Okay, this will work smoothly. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Yes. Okay, so um, I'm a postdoc in the Pisco lab with Bruce and Jane. Um, and over the past year or so, I've been working on a project with the Nature Conservancy. Um, we actually are dropping this in a press release tomorrow morning. So uh, shush for now, but um, it's about to get exciting. And uh, we should get a lot of, we think we're gonna get a lot of press, but essentially um, sea star racing disease affected um, about 20 species of sea stars along the coastline and it caused lesions, arm loss and melting like you can see in these Pycnopodia sunflower stars right here. Um, it has spread from Mexico to Alaska. The cause is still unknown um, and under debate. It was likely that it was transmissible and it was probably a virus, but we actually don't know. Um, the species hit hardest was this Pycnopodia helianthoides. It's a, it gets about this big. It's a meter wide, has 20 arms. It's super crazy and cool. Um, and our question was, how bad was this? And so we did an IUCN red list assessment. So that's the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. And they have a global list of endangered species. And what we did was, um, gathered data, as much data as we could muster. We ended up with um, 12 regions from the Aleutians to Baja, 67 different people participated in the project uh, and contributed 31 data sets that spanned 53 years. And we had over 61,000 surveys that we ended up using. Um, and what we found was that globally, the per decline in density, or actually the decline in population size, was around 90%, which merits a critically endangered listing through IUCN. And what we've, um, what I think is especially alarming is the populations have essentially flatlined from Baja, California, up to the coast of Washington. And only once you get into the Salish Sea can you even find them anymore. So you can see the percents on this uh, figure. So it's well above, it's above 98% or 97% for most of the contiguous US. In the Salish Sea and British Columbia, we have patches left, and those are around a 90 to 90-ish percent decline. Same with the Gulf, Gulf of Alaska and Southeast Alaska. We think there are some populations that haven't been hit so hard in the Aleutians, but we actually don't really know. The data are really thin there. Um, and what's more, where they are existing, we are seeing no signs of recovery. Um, if anything, they're still declining or just stat static. Um, so what does this mean? So Pycnopodia themselves are really cool, but what it matters is it's a perfect storm for kelp. So Pycnopodia died in 2013 to 15-ish. Um, they eat sea urchins and sea urchins eat kelp. At the same time as the sea stars died, we had a big urchin recruitment, at least on like the Californian coastlines, coastline. And a year after that, the blob hit and was a marine heat wave that wiped kelp out directly. Just They just hate warm water. And so these three things have combined to cause a 90% decline in bull kelp in Northern California and declines all across the continent. And that matters because kelp create habitat for lots of species. They are food, they sequester carbon, they support fisheries like their nursery habitats for rockfish, for example, and they support economies like abalone uh, and rockfish and all sorts of other things. And so what we can do are there are active um, 
pursuits for kelp restoration underway. Um, urchin harvesting is starting to be a thing. We're hoping to create an urchin market uh, for uni. Uh, right now, uni is usually from the red sea urchins, not the purples. And we are beginning a captive breeding program for Pycnopodia up at Friday Harbor West. That's what all I got. I don't know how long that was. All right, great job. Um, Ricardo. All right, next uh, we have Devon Quick, which is a senior instructor on the department. And she's going to talk to us about solving problems like a biologist. All right, um, I assume folks can all see my screen. Yep. This is, this is the thing we do, right, when we teach. Um, all right, so I am going to talk to you about solving problems like a biologist, how in-class work helps develop scientists. And this is work that I've done in collaboration with Lori Kays and an undergraduate Hannah Smith and Nate Kirk. But actually, um, there's a typo in my title. I'm solving problems like a biologist. And so for the next three and a half minutes, I'm going to talk to you about this home fumigation system to eradicate all biologists from your from your environment. Just, just kidding. Um, actually, what I'm going to be talking about is science identity. And so developing how we become biologists in our students is our primary goal. And from the very beginnings when we start thinking about becoming a biologist until the times when um, we identify as expert biologists in the field, we have all of these experiences that we go through. And many of those experiences may look something like this, but most of them probably look more like this. And you might forget what the link looks like, but this is what our classroom environment looks like at Oregon State. And so how do we then develop um, biologists in our class when it looks something like this? And the truth is, is one approach that we take is with what's called scientific teaching. So giving authentic science experiences in the classroom. And what that means is engaging our learners in active learning. So here we're seeing a view from Lori Kays' classroom, uh, Introductory Biology or Principles of Biology, um, where the students are collaborating to self-construct their knowledge. And what they're doing is they're working on activities together. It's a little hard to tell, but they have these manipulatives that are on their desks right here. And in order to have a classroom environment like this, one of the things that we realized pretty early on for a very large class is that we need some help. We need some help facilitating that work in the classroom. And that's where we've developed something called the Learning Assistant Program, where trained undergraduates come in and become part of the teaching team. And so then work to give feedback to those learners as they're, as they're becoming biologists in our classroom. And so the question that we have is, does working with LAs actually help develop that science identity? And in order to answer that, we need to appreciate that um, identity can be described as this novice to expert continuum that has three mm -hmm. basic constructs. And so this is the work of Hammer um, to describe these and that that content and structure of knowledge is one of those constructs, source of knowledge and problem solving approaches. And specifically, we focus on problem solving approaches in this talk. Um, and really what I mean by that is from the novice to expert continuum, novices might think that as biologists, there is one solution for every problem. And what I mean by that is it's a one-to-one -one ratio. So, so if I have a new problem, I need a new approach in order to solve that. But really as expert biologists, we've come to appreciate that, that we have a toolkit and that toolkit can be applied in lots of different instances to solve problems. And so ways to uh, measure and quantify this student identity or science identity is with an instrument. This is just one way to do that. Uh, that's called the Colorado Learning Attitudes About Science Survey. It's a series of 34 questions that is built around um, these different constructs of what we've identified as a science identity. And so this is a sample of a few of the questions that center around the problem solving approaches. And what we were able to do is um, ask the question, does working with LAs help students develop that science identity in the short term? And so in 2014, we had um, two classrooms, one in which the students were working on activities and LAs were there to give feedback. And the other classroom, the LAs were not present. So again, this is the principles of biology. And we have ends of about 500 in each of these two classes or two, two <laughs> And so we administered the survey on a pre post basis for that term and in looking at the um, the data that go with that we're looking at the growth in these different areas. And so problem solving approaches can have three little sort of areas in this class bio problem solving difficulty 
problem solving effort and problem solving strategies. And what you might notice is that these are negatives right here. And that might seem bad that we have somehow gone from having more expert like thinking to having more novice like thinking. And that is true. That is typical in what you see here, especially in introductory courses where you think you understand what it means to think as an expert. And then once you get to know more about that discipline, you realize, oh, wait, I don't actually know that much about this. Um, whereas over here, when we're thinking about problem solving difficulty, we see an effect of the LAs meaning that the LA somehow seem to encourage um, our students to um, have more expert-like attitudes towards problem-solving difficulty. And we think that this might help then with perseverance in the program. I'm gonna take 30 more seconds and tell you about a long-term aspect to this, which is those very same students were actually in our classes one to three years later in the upper division courses. And so we surveyed them again. Some of them had even became LAs. And when we look at the data for that, this is all those growths. These are all shifts towards more expert-like thinking for the classroom in which the students had LAs facilitating them or not. And we notice that there's no effect any longer of whether you were in an LA facilitated class or not. But what you should also see is that the LAs themselves had the most growth long-term. And so um, there's no real impact of the LA intervention, but when LAs become part of that teaching team, they develop the most in terms of their science identity. And so maybe the, um, some of the ways in which we can think about this is LAs might help our students persist in the discipline in the, in the initial stages. And then when they become part of our teaching team, that's gonna help them the most. And maybe this is one of the ways in which we can think about working with that leaky stem pipeline. I went for five minutes, forgive me. You broke all the rules, Devin. All of them. <laughs> Terrific, um, Cameron? Uh, yes, great job, Devin. Our last talk before the break will be given by Rebecca Mostow, who is a PhD candidate in our department. Her talk is titled Hybrid in a Haystack, Integrating Community Science and Population Genetics to Map a Novel Hybrid Beachgrass. Sweet. Thanks, Cameron. And thanks, everybody, for being here. It's actually really fun to just see everybody's faces and names on a slide all together. So. Um, the story I want to tell you today is about the joy of discovery and the way that I'm using um, community science or participatory science to try to share that joy with as many people as possible. So to start out, I'd like you to imagine that you are searching for a needle in a haystack, a true challenge. But instead of a bright, shiny needle, what you're actually searching for is just another piece of hay that looks almost identical to all the rest of the stack. And now imagine that the hay is actually alive and it's multiplying and it's not really a stack actually, it's like spread out over several hundred kilometers. And now imagine that the only way to get your PhD is to find that special straw. So that is pretty much what the first few years of my grad work were like, searching for a cryptic hybrid beach grass on the Oregon coast. Luckily and somewhat amazingly, I have managed to find that needle, not once, not twice, but 27 times. And every time I do find one, I feel this just a miraculous and joyful and stunning feeling. It's like the feeling of discovery. And that is the feeling that motivates me to continue and to keep going even when the dunes look like um, the picture that I'm showing here. So. You might guess the reason that I'm leaving this picture up is that the hybrid actually is in this photo. It might look very similar to all the grass around it, but it's this um, big tuft in the middle. And we have one parent species of beach grass over here and another one over here. So that feeling of discovery when I'm sort of walking along a beach and stumble upon this, what feels like a needle in a haystack, that's what keeps me going. And I am trying to share that feeling using the power of community science. So to help you understand why I get so excited to find this hybrid, we need to go back a little bit, back to around the 1890s when European settlers started to colonize the Oregon coast. And they took umbrage with the dynamic shifting sand environment that greeted them on our beaches. They introduced first one and then another species of ecosystem engineering beach grass in order to stabilize the sand and build tall dunes. And the grasses absolutely did what they were introduced to do. They spread rapidly. They built these tall dunes that act almost like a living seawall and protect the houses and communities built behind them. 
Unfortunately, these grasses also outcompete native plants and decrease the habitat for native shorebirds. And we recently discovered these two beach grass species hybridize. At first, we only found a few patches of this hybrid, but the more I search, the more I'm finding. And we're of course flooded with questions about the implications of this discovery. Will the hybrid spread? How will it affect native biodiversity? What about dune shape? Can it reproduce or back cross? Uh, will it speciate? That's a pretty big one. To answer any of these questions, the first thing we need to know though is just how much of the hybrid is out there. And so for the first few years of my PhD, I searched the coast alone, but I quickly realized that the easiest way to find a needle in a haystack is to recruit some friends. And thus began our collaboration with um, Oregon Shores and iNaturalist and Coast Watch to develop a community science or a crowdsource science project to help people help me find the hybrid. Now, this project debuted in the spring of 2020. So I think you can imagine why the rollout didn't go exactly as we had planned. However, we still managed to reach and train hundreds of community members. We've gathered 561 total beach grass observations, including 16 observations on iNaturalist of the hybrid. And thanks to this project, in the last year, we've actually identified six new hybrid patches, bringing the total number of patches up to 27 and the range of the hybrid up to 230 kilometers of coastline. And that's what I'm showing you here. And I've collected tissue samples from all of the known hybrid stands and am continuing a sequencing project with Felipe Barreto that I think will help us to understand how many independent hybridization events have occurred, whether the hybrid can back cross with its parents and just how this hybrid is spreading across the landscape. So really the more I search for the hybrid, the more I find. And I'm beginning to think that the hybrid may be more like the haystack than like the needle, which is all the more reason for you all to get involved. So you can check out the iNaturalist page that I showed you. I'll put a link in our chat. Um, and it has a lot of info about how to identify the hybrid and where to look. And who knows, you just might get to experience that joy of discovery for somebody else's science instead of your own. Awesome. So we have made it through our first set of four. And I'm gonna um, pause here for um, uh, questions, Q&A with um, our first four speakers. Um, and while people kind of think of their questions and start getting their blue Zoom hands up, I'll maybe start um, to get us kicked off. Um, and I'm gonna ask Sarah Graven about, um, I'm curious about um, the lower numbers up in the Aleutians in the Gulf of Alaska. And um, you might not, it sounds like um, sampling might be an issue there that the numbers aren't as good as other places. Um, but I'm curious if you have any hypotheses why that might be true up in Alaska, the, um, it might not be quite as bad. Yeah, good question. So first I will say that I don't think we have high confidence in that percent decline. So we have like a 60% estimate in Aleutians and West Gulf of Alaska. And that's based on like all of 20 surveys maybe. And that's 20 surveys over time, right? So like 10 before and 10 after, I, you can, and it's a big place, right? So you can't, we had to do it for IUCN because they, they wanted a global estimate. So we had to do something, but um, there is some anecdotal evidence that it, well, it A hit later, way later up there than it did down here. So it didn't hit up there until 2016 uh the one scientist who regularly surveys thinks that the population decline wasn't nearly as bad she never saw it first thing and then um the last thing is it it does seem that it's related to temperature so um that's what the next project is and that's what sarah hamilton the graduate student in our lab is leading next is a species range um model that's going to look at associations between temperature regime and disease and like current population post pre post population decline and um it's pretty clear that they at least they died they declined more in warmer temperatures and seem to be holding on better in colder temperatures um, that doesn't necessarily mean that warming caused the epidemic it just means that they survived better in the colder conditions, which makes sense because 
the virus can't spread as fast, like metabolically in colder climates. Awesome, thanks. Yeah. I see Jane has her hand raised. Yeah, great talks, everybody. This question is for Rebecca. Um, are all of the hybrid patches really distinct and isolated from the other uh, patches around them? And have you tried using anything like other uh, ways of remote sensing, like using UV or other wavelengths that might distinguish those from other from from the other species from the species that are there versus the hybrids? Yeah, thanks, Jane. That's a super good question. And yeah, so the question is like, can we use remote sensing to just search the whole coast instead of like sending out a you know a couple hundred volunteers to look um, and like try to look at their little blades and figure it out? We haven't tried it yet. It's a great question we've been thinking about. I don't have any expertise in remote sensing. And so we've kind of like been waiting for maybe somebody who knows a little bit more to join in. Um, there has been some success with um, infrared for identifying uh, invasive Spartina in marshes. And so I think there's like a possibility there. I'll say from the, from I know other people who've tried to do remote sensing on the, not the hybrid, but the Ammophila parent species and have struggled a little bit, but I, that's a great question. All right, I see Chris. Hey, and then my question is for Sarah. Um, so Sarah, you mentioned you were looking for creating a market for the uni here. And this is a culinary question because uni is one of my favorite dishes. Ooh. And our uni's, uh, the uni you can get on the market here is primarily from Asia. And oftentimes we're shipping, from my understanding, is we're shipping the uni over to Asia to have a yes. process and then come back. Yep. So um, could you, so so you mentioned that, but like what is what are the steps that have to take place to generate a fisheries of some product that isn't generally that's kind of challenging. Do you, have you, are you actually, are you part of that project? Uh, I'm not super involved in that part yet. I hope to be more in the coming months. Tom Calvinis down at, who's the director of the Port Arthur Field Station has been working with the urchin fishers and the restaurant down, restaurant down there, Redfish. Essentially there's two things. Like most people eat red urchins, which are big. They make big uni, I don't know, steaks. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I think they do taste a bit different than the purples and the purples are smaller. And essentially like the fish urchin divers just don't pick those up. And so um, right now, and so what we need to do is some like work with the urchin divers to have, see if this is a viable option for them, see if the market actually would take this like kind of, I, I think probably a slightly inferior product. And then, um, the other thing right now is that there's so many stinking urchins that they're all starving. Oh, okay. And so though there's billions of them, like literally, I think the estimate on Port Orford Reef, just Port Orford Reef was like 3 million. Um, they don't have anything in them. And so the plan right now is harvesting them, bring them to land, fattening them up, yep. and then doing local markets only for now. And then hopefully creating more incentive later. Really neat. Hey, yeah. cool. great talk. Mm -hmm. Sorry, we got time for one or two more questions if other folks have them. I see Jamie. I'll ask Devin a question. Are you here, Devin? Yeah, oh, there you are. Okay. Um, so I'm assuming this may be an incorrect assumption, but that the LA population is probably coming from the higher performing segment of the general population. Um, and obviously, correct me if I'm wrong, but have you compared some of those outcomes with kind of similar performing students uh, to the LA population? Thanks for asking, Jamie. Um, so the LAs, typically you want to, you 
typically folks recruit LAs who get A's or B's in the class. And so, yeah, they, they tend to be the more higher performing students. And some of the analyses we've looked at is, are they also the continuing generation students? Are they also the socioeconomically advantaged students? Um, and without getting into all of that nitty gritty detail, we compared their responses on the class bio. This is a project I did with Lindsay um, to students who were engaged in REUs, so research experience, um, research experiences and labs, wondering if that mentoring type relationship had a different impact on their responses compared to LAs. And what we found was that um, actually the, the development is the same. And so this is, this is good for us in the sense of the LA program because we, we wanna develop the biology identity of our students. And there's not enough capacity in things like REUs, but there's a lot more capacity in the LA system. So, so to answer your question, comparing the LAs to other sort of other, I would say, advantaged students who might end up having the time and ability to engage in extracurricular type experiences, we see the same degree of growth. The LA program, I have a theory though, tends to attract more um, students who um, come from first generation status than from continuing generation status uh, because teaching is typically seen as more of a, uh, um, an accessible entry point into the discipline compared to like a research. So do you, do you see what I'm saying? Like there's like a class issue basically associated with doing research compared to being a teacher. And so I, I think that we can recruit high performing students from a different aspect of the population um, through LA means to help develop their science identity. Terrific. I'm going to ask Devin a quick follow-up too. Um, I'm curious, um, as students experience an LA program, I'm curious if you've noticed shifts in their kind of career paths or the kind of thoughts on where they want to go in a professional sense, because you get to spend that much time with them, right? Sometimes as students and then as LAs. Um, you might not have data on this, but I'm curious if anecdotally you might um, have some observations there. Um, uh, Lindsay says everyone wants to grow up to be Devin. Um, no, like that, thank goodness they don't, because I think you only get to replace yourself with one, right? That's it. That's all we get. Um, and so uh, many of our LAs want to go into the healthcare field. That's probably tied to the fact that I teach biology. And so I don't tend to see a lot of transition out of the healthcare field into research-based experiences or, or careers um, in that way. Um, the LA programs were originally developed at other institutions as a means of teacher recruitment um, for high school, uh, specifically physics teachers, because it turns out a lot of physics is being taught in high school by biologists, not physicists. Mm -hmm. And so um, in those programs that are targeted specifically at teachers, they have seen a transition from other STEMs to teaching STEM. Um, but I would not say that that's what I have observed in our experience at OSU. Terrific. Um, I think we probably got to move on here. It's uh, 5.07 with, to round two. Um, so I think, uh, John, you're up presenting our next speaker. Yeah, thanks, Dee. Uh, thanks for all the great questions, everyone. Uh, so our next speaker for the second session is Sloshana Wasala, who is a postdoc in the department, and she will be presenting uh, a talk titled Digging into Metagenomes, Optimization of Bioinformatics Strategies for Discovering and Analyzing Symbiont DNA. Take it away, Solochina. We can't hear you. Might be mu muted, Slochina.
still nothing. Give Sulochna 15 or so seconds. Can you hear me? No. We can hear you now. Yay! Oh, okay, great. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna, sorry for the, um, let me share my screen. Can you see my screen? Okay, great. Okay, um, so did you know many important microbial endosymbionts of eukaryotic hosts that play a major role in host biology and evolution can easily go unnoticed? Well, today I'm going to tell you how metagenomics coupled with bioinformatics would help us to uncover the hidden players of parasites and pests. Metagenomics is the two words meta and genomics. Genomics is obtaining the DNA sequence of an organism, but meta implies that we are doing it for many organisms. So we are looking at the DNA sequences of all the organisms together from an environmental sample. To figure out which DNA belongs to which organism in a meta sample, we need bioinformatics tools. Ultimately, we might need to assemble those DNA sequences into genomes. However, it's not that simple. Factors like low coverage and short read lengths make the assembly of metagenomic DNA sequences into genomes difficult. Today, I'm sharing with you three steps to optimize your bioinformatics pipeline to produce better genomes. I optimized this bioinformatics pipeline to reveal previously unknown endosymbionts in plant parasitic nematodes, but this could be applied to any system. Once you collect the samples, extract DNA, and perform genome sequencing, you are ready for the bioinformatics steps. Here's how I did it. First, the resulting DNA sequences were assembled into contigs or contiguous sequences using computer software. This is a de novo assembly, meaning we do not rely on reference genomes for the assembly. After the assembly is created, to determine which sequences come from which species, blast searches were conducted using publicly available sequence databases like NCPI. This step reveals all the taxa in the sample, including microbial endosymbionts of eukaryotic hosts, which would otherwise go unnoticed. We can visualize this in a plot like this. The x-axis shows GC content and the y-axis shows coverage. Assembled DNA sequences or contigs are represented by circles in the plot and colored by taxonomic affiliation. Uh, this plot shows the result of a field sample of nematodes obtained from soil. Here, the nematode contigs are represented in gray and its bacterial endosymbionts in green and orange. The extracellular microbial community can also be identified. I call this our discovering step, and at this step, I was able to discover bacterial endosymbionts, Wolbachia, and Cardinium in some plant parasitic nematode species. Now we are excited that we discovered previously unknown endosymbionts in our targeted organism. However, this step is not enough if you are expecting to get complete draft genomes for further analysis. And we need a little more optimization based on what we are interested in. If you are interested in uh, extracting the genomes of newly discovered organisms in this sample, you need to create a custom database for Blastin. This custom database should consist of uh, all the available reference genomes of uh, the species of interest. And I call this our targeted Blastin. 
the final step is to extract candidates or draft genomes out of the meta-assembly for further analysis. From this method, I can identify a microbial endosymbionts in parasitic nematodes, their impact on host biology and evolution, and how we can use them against parasitic nematodes. With a little customization, you can apply this method to your system of interest. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Cameron, you're up next. Great job, Slojana. Our next presenter is Andrea Burton, who is a PhD candidate in the department. Her talk is titled, Does the sea star species, Pisastero Croatius, show genetic variation for resistance to sea star wasting disease? Take it away, Andrea. Thanks for the intro. Um, and thank you everyone for being here. So yeah, um, as Sarah was talking about earlier, uh, you may be familiar with the sea star wasting event um, that has decimated the uh, sea star populations along the Western coast, um, including here in Oregon, um, in which I'm gonna be focusing the study on. So this outbreak impacted uh, 20 species of sea stars, including the keystone species Pisaster ocracius, um, in which the Barreto and the Mangay lab has uh, joined forces in order to uh, study for this. So the causation of sea star wasting, as Sarah mentioned earlier, is unresolved. I'm gonna put my cat down because she's being annoying. Um, however, there may be a potential for Pisaster to adapt to sea star wasting, um, depending on if there is a genetic basis for resisting uh, factors attributing to sea star wasting. Um, and so I'm gonna focus more on looking at the potential for resistance or adaptation. Uh, this has been already kind of reported in the literature. So shown here, Shibel Hutt and colleagues found that there were shifts in allele frequencies um, in Pisaster samples collected in California before and after the sea star wasting event in 2014. Um, and they see that there is sort of a differentiation in the um, haplotypes and the allele frequencies between uh, sea stars before and after. However, due to the study looking at um, only like pre and post uh, Pisaster, there could be a number of other factors that could have influenced the, sh the shift between the populations before and after the sea star wasting event. event. So um, Sarah and the members of the Mangi lab went out and sampled sea star Pisaster specimens in 2016, during which time the sea star wasting uh, was still being reported and observed in multiple sites along the Oregon coast. So this provided us a number of um, large samples in, in which we could look at sea star wasting resistance between symptomatic and asymptomatic individuals. Asymptomatic individuals were found at similar locations, often adjacent to symptomatic individuals. So they likely have had similar exposures to factors that may be attributing to causing sea star wasting. So this provides a unique uh, data set and opportunity to compare resistance and non-resistant non individuals side by side, allowing us to tackle the question, is there a genetic basis that could aid in resistance to sea star wasting? So, we had, they had sampled over 400 um, C uh, Pisaster samples of which 200 um, were sequenced and um, 180 of them uh, had symptomatic uh, or 118 of them were asymptomatic and then 82 exhibited symptoms of sea star wasting. Uh, we then conducted a genome wide genotyping method in order to estimate allele frequencies in polymorphic sites with the goal of finding SNPs, which are contributing to differences between symptomatic and asymptomatic individuals. For these samples, we found around 75,000 SNPs across three populations. And one of the methods used to analyze this data set was a multivariate analysis in which we used a principal components method and used discriminant functions to describe clusters of genetically related individuals. Within these three populations, which are interestingly noted as north, middle, and south populations, uh, we see a separation between symptomatic and asymptomatic individuals, and they're in order in figures of north being figure A, middle, figure B, and C, the southern population. So results from this analysis allowed us to find a number of influential loci that may be attributing to sea star wasting resistance, providing evidence that there may be a genetic basis for sea star wasting 
and um, resistance within Pyzaster. And so this indicates that maybe there is a potential for Pyzaster acreaceus to adapt to sea star wasting in the future. I was going to end that that was uh, a really positive note when thinking about sea star wasting, but after seeing Sarah's talk, I don't know how I currently feel about that statement anymore. So that's my talk. Depends on which species you're talking about. <laughs> Terrific. I think uh, Ricardo, you're up next. All right. Uh, so the next speaker is going to be Meta Landis, and she's talking about improving equity and the student experience in a challenging upper division biology course through increased exam access. Hello, can you uh, hear me and see my screen? Yes, great. Uh, so, um, Uh, so basically, uh, I want to talk to you, thanks for being here, everyone. I want to talk to you about an educational research study that I've initiated with this amazing research team listed here. And the focus of our study is to improve equity and the student experience in a biology course. And we're interested in this topic um, because, as you probably know, around the U.S., up to 45% of undergraduates that enter the biological sciences drop out. And this is not equal across demographic groups, so attrition is higher in students of color and also um, in students of lower socioeconomic, socioeconomic status. So um, how could we increase retention of our bi biology students? Research shows that both cognitive and non-cognitive elements can make a difference. So with respect to non-cognitive elements, things like student motivation and student attitudes about their field can increase retention. So we asked the research question, could we perhaps improve some of these elements with a public exam system. And we've heard about the public exam system uh, from Ben Wiggins. He was one of the speakers for the Ivy seminar in the beginning of fall. So just to quickly review, the instructor will pre-release an incomplete version of each exam in advance of an actual exam. And just to give you an idea of what one of those questions might look like, here you see um, one of those exams, exam questions pre-released with a topic revealed, a point values revealed, the question context revealed, but then the actual question is hidden and would only be revealed on the actual exam. So uh, we predicted that, would, that there would be some benefits to this public exam system. And this is in comparison to the more traditional high pressure um, surprise exam system that's typically used in science courses. So we predicted that this would improve the readability of exams, which could be especially important for non-native English speakers also for students that are a uh, first generation status because they might not have been exposed as much to the language of college and their upbringing. And this could improve equity in the exam taking experience. We also predict that uh, public exams would will decrease unproductive stress levels. And so with re uh, reduced stress, students can uh, have more effective learning and develop more mature attitudes about their field. They will feel they actually belong in the field because they're not stressed out by their field. And this, this decrease in stress could be especially important for demographic groups with uh, less resilience to handle any additional stress. So think about students facing housing insecurity or chronic systemic racism. So again, uh, the prediction is that these types of exams would increase equity. We also predict that it would increase student confidence in accurate, accuracy of assessments. This might help students gain uh, motivation. They believe that they can rise to the challenge of a complex exam. And finally, because students can interact with a context of a question ahead of time, instructors can write higher order exam questions. And this can lead to gains in learning and also the development of a stronger science identity. So we plan to test these predictions. We're going to collect data from students enrolled in genetics, uh, my genetics course through eCampus, and we'll compare terms in which I run public exams versus these high pressure traditional surprise exams and we'll be comparing gains uh, for students across terms using validated survey instruments administered at the beginning and at the end of the term. So I've listed those survey instruments here. Devin talked about the third one. Thank you, Devin. Um, and so again, we're gonna we predict that uh, with a public exam system, um, students will develop higher gains in learning, 
uh, motivation and attitudes about their field to possibly improve retention and success. We also plan to administer a demographic questionnaire during week three, uh, and we'll use this to test whether public exams um, increase equity in the course. So for example, whether public exams reduce disparities in performance or learning or attitudes between different groups. So stay tuned for our results. We are launching the study in winter of 2021. Also, uh, we have some ideas for a future study. If any of you are interested in joining our team, uh, we'd love to compare benefits of public exams across different courses. So for example, between lower and upper division courses. Thank you. Permita, thank you very much. Um, one to go, um, amazing talks. Um, it's my honor to introduce Jane Lubchenco, um, who is an inspiration and a role model to all of us. Um, and the talk of her title is Integrating Ocean Science into Policy and Action. Take it away, Jane. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> Can you see my screen? Yes. Yep. Great, okay. So scientists often wonder um, if and how their science can influence policy and action. And so my focus for this lightning talk is on integrating biology with other sciences to help politicians and other global leaders address big global problems. My science, ocean science innovation team works on this challenge and others. And a recent example comes from the ocean panel which is a self-organized group of like-minded heads of state from 14 countries. Collectively, these 14 nations represent one third of the territorial waters of the global ocean. So what they do actually matters quite a bit. And for the last three years, I've helped uh, this large, uh, a large international group of scientists produce knowledge that was responsive to the interests of the policymakers and offer them a range of possible actions and solutions. The panel itself identified a range of topics. I co-organized 20 groups of experts and facilitated the production of summaries of knowledge on each of those topics. The light blue topics that you see on the screen are those that OSU scientists contributed directly to. For example, Kirsten was a lead author on the ocean genome paper. Each group produced a peer reviewed blue paper or a special report. So 19 of those in total. Some of the papers synthesized existing information, others had to initiate a brand new analysis to answer the questions that the policymakers asked. My colleagues and I also wrote a grand synthesis of knowledge together with a roadmap to pull it all together and as a way of suggesting to the policymakers how to get from today's depleted and disrupted ocean to a healthy ocean that provides nutritious seafood, clean energy, climate mitigation and adaptation, recreational opportunities, good jobs, all the things that they want. Amazingly, <clears throat> the 14 global leaders have now committed to specific actions that we teed up for them to achieve those goals. So one quick example to make this a little more concrete. One of the climate analyses provided some remarkable findings that the ocean could actually play a big role in climate mitigation. This was surprising because until now, most mitigation efforts have focused primarily on land-based options, renewable energy, more efficient buildings, transportation, appliances, or planting forests. This figure shows the maximum annual emission reduction potential that might be possible from five categories of ocean-based activities. From the left to the right uh, on the screen there, <clears throat> ocean-based renewable energy, ocean-based transport, uh, blue carbon ecosystems, shifting diets from less animal protein from the land to more seafood protein, and carbon storage in the seabed. Now, shifting uh, <clears throat> uh, the astounding finding was that these five categories total up to 21% or one fifth of the greenhouse gas emission reductions that are needed to achieve the 1.5 degree target by 2050. So that's a pretty powerful finding. 
Uh, it's especially encouraging to know that there are more tools in our mitigation toolbox than we thought. So these findings really place the ocean front and center in the climate mitigation policy world going forward. So last week, these 14 global leaders announced over 74 bold, ambitious, but practical commitments in this document that you see here called the transformations document, specifying ways that they intend to embrace climate mitigation options, protect biodiversity, make fisheries sustainable and much more. They're really exciting commitments uh, and they are already delivering on some of them. Uh, you can read more about it uh, at the website oceanpanel.org, but it's pretty remarkable to have come this far. So their commitments really reflect <clears throat> integrated, more holistic understanding that the scientists tried to tee up for them and that they bought, uh, getting away from the sector by sector, issue by issue approach that really typifies what governments do today. <clears throat> so the ocean policy framing, the ocean panel framing, uh, had their actions as an integrated package of effective protection leading to sustainable production and equitable prosperity, understanding that they go hand in hand. Moreover, the ocean panel uh, understands that governments alone cannot make all the changes that are needed. And so they invited industry, NGOs, local communities, indigenous groups, financial institutions, and others to join forces to implement multi-stakeholder approaches to a variety of different uh, actions, one on seafood, one on uh, clean energy from the ocean, et cetera. Uh, and the idea is that the ocean panel uh, can't do it all alone and the action will actually require engagement by multiple uh, entities. So in short, the ocean panel began by seeking guidance from scientists. That's pretty unusual and it's actually pretty refreshing. And then they use that knowledge to create new policies and practices that are bold and ambitious and I believe hopeful. And they are engaging other key players to focus on, on the water, on the ground action to follow up. So this ocean panel work provides, I think a new model for integrating science and using it to benefit society. Thanks. Wow, terrific. Thank you so much, Jane. I um, mean, thank you to all the speakers that um, stepped up and stepped forward um, to share their work with us today. Um, so we'll have um, some time here for a final round of Q&A. Um, and like last time, I'll maybe um, start it off by asking, um, Jane, I'm curious, interacting with all these heads of state, um, how you found um, different individuals to be responsive? Like were there particular heads of state that were um, more enthusiastic or engaged in all of this? Um, or was it pretty much kind of uniform enthusiasm and more kind of teamwork approach? Yeah, they all sort of agreed to buy into this, but the cultural differences were really obvious in a lot of what they did. And what was interesting about this was that um, some are some were quite comfortable interacting with scientists, others less so. They kind of wanted to go through somebody who they thought they could understand. And then they quickly realized that the scientists that were talking to them actually could speak in plain language. And so that broke down some barriers and made the science a little more accessible to them. Um, but not only did the policymakers listen to scientists, but they listened to each other. They did a lot of talking and they learned from each other. And so the issues for climate change are really different in Norway versus Palau, for example, or in Chile versus Indonesia. And so the cultural, economic, uh, historic differences among the nations actually had a lot of, uh, it resulted in their being able to come up with ideas and solutions and a path forward that was much better than any one of them could have done alone. It was a really interesting exercise. 
Wow. Yeah. Global awareness. Um, terrific. Thanks. I see uh, John's hand up. John's the panic. Yeah, this question's for Solution. I'm just curious of for all of this um, sort of sequencing you're doing, how often do you come across new uh, strands um, that, that don't fit into any of these kind of this BLAST database? And if you could provide a little bit more context for what it entails trying to reconstruct something that might potentially be um, uh, an undiscovered species. Yeah, John. Um, so uh, it is a good question, and um, it actually depends on depends on the NCBI database, as you said. So um, if the database does not uh, have the information uh, you are looking for, or uh, so it won't because we are hitting uh, our sequences uh, to the database, right? Um, so that's why we need a little bit of customization, but the first step is to go to NCBI. So in, in NCBI, you have a lot of options. You have eukaryotic reference genomes, you have prokaryotic reference genomes, and uh, just uh, nucleotide sequences and RNA sequences and protein, everything. So uh, first uh, step, uh, so I did a nucleotide uh, uh, blasting. And uh, when you identify uh, endosymbiont, a potential endosymbiont uh, that's previously unknown uh, to exist in this uh, eukaryote, uh, the best thing is to do is, uh, as I said, uh, to uh, create your, so you can, uh, so you know this genus now, right? And then you have to come up with a custom database to create um, we, with all the reference genomes uh, in the database, uh, and then you can um, match to your uh, custom database. Is uh, am I answering your question? Is that I'm going? Yeah. So uh, the first step is to go to NCBI, I would say, uh, and then uh, go to custom database, uh, depending on what species you are discovering. Great. My question is for me. Well, and this has been so wonderful. First of all, to say it's really, really fun to, to hear such a wide variety of talks. But uh, so it seemed to me like this method of of examining student knowledge is really conducive to like facilitating peer discussions about material, um, because of course nothing motivates them more than you know. They're going to be tested on these things. Is that part of the the prediction for how uh, for kind of you know equalizing equity and um, improving student understanding of the material, or is that a confounding factor that might be you know needed to be considered? I think it would definitely uh, contribute to improving uh, learning outcomes and uh, and motivation and attitudes. The trouble is that I can't get the students in my online class to do that. So I've encouraged them repeatedly, you know, use the discussion board uh, announcements, you know, talk to each other, discuss the questions. Uh, and I have students not even accessing the public exams until like the day of the exam. So I'm now uh, trying to think of ways to force the interaction to happen earlier. So maybe by forcing them to write a reflection about one of the public exam questions, but, uh, I think that the discussion would be very valuable and I think it'd be much easier in a face-to-face um, -face environment than in an online environment. I'm having trouble with that. All right, I'm gonna go to Lindsay next. Thanks all. My question's also for Meta. I know that from my experience, both as a student and as an instructor, sometimes your exam question is kind of public before the exam, but maybe you haven't told your students that that's the question. So maybe you've shared it as a practice problem at one point or given them a figure that ends up being a figure on the exam. And I wonder if you, um, versus like an, an entirely novel problem that they've never seen before. And so I'm wondering if you guys have considered kind of the, those three scales of totally novel, something the students have directly seen but weren't told was the exam question versus a truly kind of public, I've told you this is what's gonna be on the exam. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, I so for for we have I haven't thought about it, but that's a great uh, a great thing to think about. So for for my particular study, our surprise uh, exams, those questions are are really surprise questions. I mean, they they are not 
they haven't seen those questions anywhere. They haven't seen those um, that figure anywhere. I mean, they may have interacted with similar types of questions in problem sets, but it would be totally novel. So, but that's interesting. I'll think about that more as I'm developing the study. Thank you, Lindsay. Let's go to Chris. My question is for Andrea. Andrea, like on your PyZaster um, project, so the the allelic dif differences across the coast. When was is there anything known about like the when was the Pisaster genus like revised last? Like, do you are you in, in their natural history? Like, how it, how are the populations distributed on that coast? Like, are we sure that it's one species? Are we sure that it's all the same population? Um, how does the, How does the gene flow work? Do you do you know that at all? Uh, for so like geography wise, I, I would have to refer more to Sarah to sort of differentiate between like speciation of Pisaster and things like that. Um, but I will say there is pretty well-known literature that they are very widely distributed that they, because they- So they're pelagic or something in their- Yeah, life. they're pelagic. They, they spawn out and then sort of come together uh, on, in their tides. But I don't really have like a good answer about how, how like variable individual like tides could be. Maybe Sarah knows, I'm not sure. No, I, I, I wasn't sure. And I also, uh, in your, your talk in the other one earlier on the sea star wasting, uh, are there, is, is, you both mentioned that there's, you know, 20 some species that are affected. How many species are not affected? Like, are, do we have a sea star population that's kind of just fine? <laughs> <laughs> Again, I'm not sure Sarah probably would know. I'm more focusing just on Pythester. <laughs> okay, okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll field it. Um, <laughs> well, for the first question, I mean, Pisaster as a genus has been around forever. Um, I don't think there's a, anybody who suspects there's like a multi-species complex happening here. But, uh, and I think I remember there's a paper in like the early 2000s when genetic connectivity of studies used first became easy um, that essentially said they're panmectic. Um, because they have pelagic larval phases that swim around in the ocean for like three weeks or a month. And so I think there's been another one recently that found a little more structure than that, but like they're not, you know, isolated populations in any way. And then the second question is about the species. So those are 20 species who at least we saw get sick. Um, many of them didn't have the sorts of like population crashes that we saw for you know the five most effective species so example the bat star which is that one that has like the webbed um arms uh barely got sick they saw some of them that had symptoms but it wasn't too bad and then there was that six arm sea star that's like this big it's called leptosterius uh it's very hard to find but once you find it you you squeal because they're very cute um and they were affected like probably some percentage like 10 percent maybe died but their populations really haven't hit taken a hit so there are certainly individual species that made it through it seems like the ones that are like the bigger predators really got hit but it really didn't follow like a taxonomic logic that we could detect or even maybe a little bit of dietary one but not taxonomic all right, I see um, John, I see your hand. Is that a latent hand or is that a new hand? My apologies, that's a latent one. I'll take it down. No worries. Um, all right, so um, I think we should wrap it up. I wanna say um, thank you to everybody. Um, that was just really outstanding. I appreciated hearing um, all of the amazing work happening. Um, thanks to the IBGSA co-presidents for helping me organize and um, introduce folks during these talks. Um, I want to do more of this as we go ahead. I think this was really great, um, great community building exercises we can do in these remote times. I welcome feedback. I think anything can continuously be improved nonstop. So if you have ideas or thoughts on ways to improve this, tweak it, change it a little bit, feel free to shoot me an email or pop by my office hour um, to discuss. But once again, thank you very much to the speakers. Thanks to everyone um, for coming. Um, and enjoy um, what remains of finals week. Take care. <laughs>